Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Morning Coffee with Cameron. In today's video, we're here to kick off the Future Garage Mega Series, which is a project I've been working on for quite some time that ended up kind of having to take a back seat to some other stuff as I got really busy and whatnot, but the time is finally here and I'm very excited. So this whole thing is going to be one giant series all about Future Garage. We're going to be talking about just kind of an overview and some history and some basic concepts. We'll be talking about sound design ranging from the big lush atmospheres and stuff to how to create the big, thick, juicy bass lines. We'll be talking about field recording, how to do field recording, how to process your field recordings, how to design your drum sounds and things like that. We'll also be talking about some music theory and arrangement tips. I'm also going to try and do some interviews with some of my favorite artists, but that's going to come down to them and their schedule. And on top of that, I'm also going to do a couple of free sample packs for you guys. Those aren't totally ready yet, but they will be ready soon. In the meantime, though, I have a bunch of free sample packs on my website, and I have a couple of paid packs as well that are geared specifically towards this style. I have Mori and Meridian and Phantom, and all of those are designed for this kind of style and genre. So in this first video today, we're going to be talking about what is Future Garage, just kind of an overview and some general history. I wanted to talk about some stylistic and aesthetic considerations. I wanted to talk about some of my favorite artists and recommended listening, as well as just some recommended gear and other things to consider maybe picking up if you want to make this style of music yourself. So first off, let's talk a little bit about the history and the origins of Future Garage. If you're familiar with genres like two-step and UK Garage, this is basically the starting point of where Future Garage stemmed from. Future Garage has its origins in kind of the early and mid-2000s coming from the UK, as most good music genres do. Now, I'm sure all of you guys know about Burial, and I would argue that Burial and Fortet are kind of the two OGs of this genre. Now, Burial and Fortet both produce a very dark, moody, brooding sound that almost has tinges of industrial to it, and this, I think, stems from their environment, and I think ultimately that is what Future Garage is all about. So they had this kind of dark style, and it eventually evolved into kind of a dark and deep dub step influence thing, and then Future Garage as a whole kind of fell out of the public eye for a while. Now, I've been really into Future Garage stuff and all that for a long time now, and I do remember this period when I was in school and getting into high school and stuff that there just wasn't a lot of new music out there. There were a couple of artists, but everything kind of went the way of, you know, like the Americanized bro step stuff, and that's really all I could find. But there were sites like the Future Garage Forum, which is now gone, but I think there's a Discord for it instead. Uh, there's Dogs on Acid, and this is kind of where I picked up a lot of my musical taste in that time finding these new artists. However, once we got into the 2010s and over the last decade or so, there was kind of a big resurgence of Future Garage in a multitude of different kind of styles and moods and versions of it, which is really cool because it's evolved quite a bit. Anymore, there are so many different styles of Future Garage, and there are a lot of really great artists. There's a huge scene in Russia and Eastern Europe, which is where Future Garage is really kind of blowing up at the moment. There's also some scenes in kind of the Southern Europe region. There's also stuff coming out of like the Netherlands I've noticed a lot of, and it's just really cool. And every region has their own kind of interesting take and style on it. And we have, you know, the kind of original moody, broody, dark, grimy Future Garage type stuff to the more modern, refined, hyper digital, clean and polished style and just about everything in between. So it's a very exciting time for the scene. Now, I think one of the most important things about Future Garage and creating Future Garage music is the stylistic and aesthetic considerations you would have as an artist and as a producer. Now, any jackass can crack open their DAW and add swing to a 16th note pattern and say, look at me, I made a Future Garage. And I think that's great and all, but I think ultimately that's not what Future Garage is. Future Garage is one of the more artsy, interpretive music genres out there. And that's what I really love about it. And I think the best Future Garage comes from people who have kind of those artsy fartsy vibes and really put something into their music. Now, not all Future Garage needs to be this dark, moody, broody stuff. There are some very uplifting tracks out there and some artists that produce kind of a more uplifting and dreamy type of Future Garage. And I think that's the biggest thing is it's all about injecting a piece of yourself and the way you feel about things into your music, because that's what creates a really great track, not only in Future Garage, but in all genres of music. So, you know, you can open up your DAW and make screechy rhythm and stuff, but I think that those styles don't really lend themselves much to contributing something as an artist. And I think that's why Future Garage has always been something that I've really liked, because I tend to be drawn to those more kind of heady, abstract genres. And I think a lot of you guys enjoy that stuff as well. When it comes to the stylistic and aesthetic considerations, like I said earlier, Burial and Fortet being kind of the OGs had this dark, brooding, industrial type quality to their music, and I think that stems heavily from the environment they were in, which is, you know, urban London, which I would argue is very conducive to what they created and what they continue to create. It's just this kind of dark, 
drab thing that's influenced probably by, you know, the dark alleyways and big industrial steam vents and the trains and whatever. And I think that's just kind of what it's all about is finding your voice. The stuff I hear out of Russia a lot tends to have very big open sounds, but also kind of tinges of industrial and I don't know, almost cold vibes to it. And, you know, that's just something that you have to find for yourself. And I think that's something that took me a long time to figure out as an artist. And I think in my own music, one of the biggest influencing factors is where I live. I live in an area where there's a lot of really big, wide open spaces that go on forever and ever and ever, but there's also these really dense woods. And that's something that really contributes to the way I write and the way I create my music. So this can mean a lot of different things to you. Maybe you live in a very urban environment and those are the things that influence you. Maybe you live out in the suburbs and you're just bored and want to move to a big city. Maybe you live somewhere and you want to move far away from everyone and just go wander away in the woods and just kind of get lost and explore. I think it's also very important to practice some degree of self-awareness. Like maybe you looked up at the sky one night and you just saw all these stars. You know, how did that make you feel? Or maybe you look up at the sky and you can't see any stars. How does that make you feel? What do you feel or think about when you see a big storm coming in or it's really raining hard outside? And you know, what's it like to be you at 3 a.m. when no one else is around and you're alone? I think ultimately that's what makes Future Garage special, is it's all about the emotional interpretation of the music and the emotional impact of every single sound that comes together to create something bigger than the sum of its parts. Now I understand how all this could maybe sound a little bit elitist, and that's not my intention at all. I think what I'm trying to say here is it's all about just injecting that little piece of yourself and that moment that you want to capture that you don't have words for. And I think that's why this genre is really cool and is different than, you know, a lot of the other stuff that you can just download a serum preset pack and some drum kits and crap out in five minutes. So in case you're not maybe all that familiar with the genre or maybe you just are looking for some new music, I wanted to give you guys some recommended listening. So I've got a quick list here. So I've got Burial and Fortet, which I would say are obvious. Cossack is one of my favorite producers, along with Direct, who I really, really enjoy. TBFM is someone who's pretty new to me. I haven't heard their music before, uh, but really, really cool stuff. I'm not sure if that's supposed to be pronounced a certain way. Uh, Bucky and Space Outers, I really loved those guys. They're really, really cool. La Soul, Vesky, and River Silvers as well. Um, those would probably be my recommended artists to check out, and those are some of my favorites. Beyond that, there are a lot of really great mixed channels and channels that promote this style of music. So I'm gonna leave some links to those down below. Um, those are where I discover a lot of new artists and a lot of the new music I really love. So definitely go check them out because you might find someone you really like and, you know, maybe just get a feel for the genre as a whole. So finally, to close off part one here, I wanted to talk about some recommended gear and things like that. Now, before we get into this, just let me say that I don't think you really need to purchase any of this. As long as you have a DAW, your DAW probably comes with everything you need to make this style as it's ultimately pretty simple and it's a lot just about processing and kind of getting creative. However, maybe you've been producing for a minute and you understand that not every synth is going to do everything and you might know the limitations of the gear you have, or perhaps you just want something new to experiment with. So first up is some kind of subtractive synth, and just about every DAW comes with one of these, but I think there are a couple that really stand out, and especially in the style, just to the way they sound and, you know, work. So the first ones I would name off are Dune 3 and Rapid. I love both of these synthesizers very much, and I highly recommend them. They're very flexible, very powerful, and have a very, very nice sound to them. Beyond that, Serum is another great subtractive synth that also has a lot of extra features like wavetables and warp modes and a lot of really cool filters and stuff. It also has the advantage of being very popular, so there are probably a bunch of different presets out there for it. I'm working on some future garage presets for Serum myself. Outside of that, there's Kilohertz Faceplant, which is just an absolute beast, and I highly recommend Faceplant in general. It's a very very powerful synthesizer that covers a lot of ground. Next up, some kind of FM synthesizer. FM synthesis is pretty important to Future Garage because it allows you to create a lot of other kind of textures and tonalities that you can't really get out of a standard subtractive synthesizer. So for this, there's things like Phase Plant, which is an absolute beast for this type of stuff. Rapid has some really great FM features as well. Serum has a little bit of FM, but probably not what I would consider the most capable FM synth. Other than that, there's FM8, which is super, super powerful as well. Maybe not the most popular, maybe not the most modern, but I would say any of these would do a great job. Next up, I would really recommend some kind of granular something or other. There are a lot of different granular things out there. There's a couple of Macs for live devices if you're an Ableton user that I think are free. I'm not really sure. I don't really use Ableton. Falcon 2 has an amazing granular engine. There's standalone pieces of software like Paul Stretch or Cecilia. I use Cecilia 5 all the time 
time. There's Ribs, which is free. There's also, you know, other things like Pad Shop, which is a VST, but it's something from Cubase, and Pad Shop's another really, really good choice as well. However, a granular thing isn't really totally required. I just find them very handy for creating textures and atmospheres, and I think it's something you should consider picking up if you don't have one. Reverb is also extremely important, and there are two free ones that I want to highlight, as I'm sure you guys are aware, Tal Reverb 4 and Oral River. These are great utility reverbs that do a lot of stuff, but they're also awesome for just cranking and making these huge, lush, epic soundscapes. Other than that, there are tons of other reverbs out there. There's a bunch of freed ones, a bunch of paid ones. Maybe just check them out, see which one you like. But I would recommend at least one or two reverbs that are capable of going to, you know, 20 plus seconds of decay time to make these insane, intense atmospheres. Delay is also pretty important, and you could get something free like the Tal Dub delays. Arteria has some new delays that are paid. Uh, there's a lot of other free and paid delays out there. Your DAW, I'm sure, has some kind of delay in it, and more often than not, the stock DAW delay will do what you need it to do. However, I would argue that due to kind of the organic and, you know, aesthetic arty vibe of the genre, some kind of saturated tape-ish delay would probably be something worth picking up. Modulation effects are also incredibly important. Again, your DAW probably has a bunch of these like chorus, flanger, phaser, things like that, but maybe the ones in your DAW aren't all that great. I know some DAWs don't really have a nice sounding phaser or anything, so you could pick up another one as well. I really like the stuff within the Reason 11 VST, but you know, beyond that, there's tons of different free and paid modulation effects out there. So maybe just, you know, consider picking something up if your DAW doesn't really have good ones. Compressors are also another very important thing to have, and your DAW probably has some kind of straight up digital compressor, which is great. Those are very handy. However, I think there are a couple other types of compressor emulations that do a very good job of helping attribute to this overall style due to the way they behave. These would be a LA-2A emulation and an 1176 emulation. There are a whole ton of these out there, both free and paid, I would recommend picking up some kind of optical compressor emulation and, you know, just some other analog compressor emulations, because they usually add just a bit of character as well, which a straight up digital compressor isn't going to impart on whatever you're feeding through it. To a similar note, tape saturators and stuff like that, these are very important to have because it adds just a bit of grit and, you know, feel to whatever you're running through it. So there's a bunch of free tape simulators out there and stuff like that. My favorite would be Hornet Tape or PSP Mix Saturator. I use those two all the time. There's also things like Hornet Analog Stage, which is a great plugin just to throw on tracks and, you know, add a bit of color and whatever. And again, there's a bunch of different free and paid tape saturators and, you know, console analog emulation things out there, but definitely something worth picking up for sure. Finally, I would recommend some kind of field recorder and field recording setup. Now, keep in mind, this is a pretty expensive step in this process, and if you're brand new to this whole thing, I wouldn't bother because, you know, more often than not, you can just use your phone. I use my phone to record samples all the time. Your phone usually has a pretty decent microphone built in, and it's probably always with you. So whenever you're out and about, hear a cool sound, you can just record that in a pinch rather than having to carry, you know, a big field recording setup with you wherever you go. I personally use a Zoom H4n Pro. This thing is very near and dear to my heart. I love it, and I think it sounds great. It's got some really great built-in microphones. It's also got XLR inputs, so I can plug my other favorite microphones into it. And it's, you know, relatively small and discreet, so I can sample in public areas without looking like a psychopath. Further to this would be some extra microphones that you can have. I have my S Mic 2 and a Movo BWS 1000, which is what I use for a lot of my sound design field trips and recording. I'm actually using the S Mic 2 right now to record my voice. It's a great microphone that's very cheap. Uh, the blimp is great just to, you know, isolate it from everything else. Beyond that, having some condenser microphones or other microphones around your home studio is a great investment as well. I would probably recommend some kind of large diaphragm condenser and some kind of small diaphragm condenser microphones. These are good just to have for, you know, recording Foley sounds within your studio in a hopefully more controlled and acoustically treated environment. Um, other than that, you know, just recording vocals or have your friend come over and play their flute or guitar or, you know, whatever. Just having a microphone and a space to record sounds in a more controlled and you know, nice sounding environment, I think is a good thing to have. However, again, totally not 100% necessary, just something nice to have if you do have a home recording studio setup and, you know, a nice, somewhat acoustically treated room, definitely a good thing to consider maybe adding on in the future. So yeah, I think that covers all the groundwork and stuff I wanted to cover in part one here. So thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Stay tuned for part two. Be sure to like and subscribe, and I will see you guys again soon.